all right, so welcome. Um, we have our third session about Golang, uh, and I was kind of just minutes ago immersed in Haskell. <laughs> I was preparing for uh, next week uh, in, in Haskell, so I have to uh, like uh, switch context. So join the Mentimeter and we will see what I have prepared. <clears throat> so you can ask questions in the Menti, you can ask questions here, uh, and you can ask questions in Zoom for the Zoom people. All right, so we have already, we're starting with the quiz. All right, an easy one. We discussed that in uh, PROC 206 already. So yes, concurrency and parallelism are not the same, although they kind of uh, co colloquially are often in used interchangeably. So we often say parallel programming or concurrent programming and so on. So technically, when we're doing programming, most of the time we're actually talking about concurrency, unless you're going into GPUs and you're really doing parallel processing and parallel programming, then you sort of distinguish those two. But you know, norm normally we uh, sort of focus on concurrency. All right, so Golang has a good support for concurrency. Um, so let's see, what's the difference? Well, the difference is that uh, concurrency is, is possible on a single CPU. So if you have a single, single threaded CPU, no you know, hardware multi-threading or anything, you can still have concurrency, right? So in the old days, when we had kind of a computers with a single CPU, no hardware multi-threading, we could still play games and the game was doing a lot of different things concurrently, even though on the hardware level, it was done on a single CPU, right? So how is that achieved? Well, it is achieved by kind of a time multiplexing, right? So we allocate a little bit of time of the CPU to do one thing, and then we kind of um, put it on hold and we do a little bit of something else in the other, another slot of the of the time that we have on the single CPU, right? So concurrency allows us to 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 uh, to do that. And when you learned um, uh, concurrent programming constructs like threads, for example, in your C plus plus course uh, or in the operating systems, when you talked about processes and and threads, that's what it is. It's the operating system kind of uh, presenting to you something that appears to be parallel. But in fact, it, it often runs on a single CPU, right? Uh, when you really want something to be physically concurrent, physically parallel, you need a hardware support. And a lot of modern CPUs are multi-core CPUs, and even the cores have kind of a parallel multi-threading. So you can have on a single CPU, sometimes you have two or four um, parallel threads that can run at the same time. Um, so concurrency supports concurrent execution and concurrent programs can benefit from hardware parallelism. So because we almost never run things on a single CPU systems anymore, even your mobile phone may have four, eight or 16 concurrent threads that can run. We want to cr create software which they can advantage of that, right? And to do this, we need ability to express in code things that can run um, at the same time. So that's why concurrency is kind of a big deal. And that's why for the last, you know, 10, 15 years, we've been migrating from really single sequential um, code to code that can take advantage of the um, multi-core platforms that we have around. So when I was studying like you are uh, programming, um, we didn't care about that that much because everything around was just single single CPU, no multi hardware multi-threading. Um, and some old languages like Python, for example, they kind of are in that era, right? Where you did not have um, ability to express threading and kind of concurrency. But Golang, Golang is a little bit more modern and it kind of um, takes advantage of that. So question two.
All right. I think we talked a little bit about it in the first lecture. So let's see what do you remember? What is the concurrency in Go inspired by? Yeah, philosophical question. So remember when, when we were discussing um, programming languages, was it here or was it in the other course? We had this kind of a tree of a hierarchy uh, and we were discussing what the languages came from. And we had like a three lines. One was uh, C, then we had Smalltalk and then we had ML and then we had those three main branches. And then the branch kind of following on the left from C was uh, concurrent sequential processes. So CSP. It's like a paradigm for expressing sequential executions of code which talks to each other. So the CSP is the kind of inspiration for, uh, for Go, for Golang. So CSP, uh, concurrent sequential processes. Um, all right, uh, so a little bit of uh, memory lane. All right, we have one more. Oh yeah, so that's uh, an interesting one. Where is the concurrency coming from in Golang? So if you check, for example, uh, C++ or C, right? Where is the concurrency in C coming from? Well, in C, the concurrency comes from the standard library, which is provided by, um, you know, uh, uh, is it Gthreads? Uh, there is basically an operating Unix standard library, which Unix operating systems provide to C, and then you can use multi-threading. That was missing in Windows, right? So in C, doing threading on Windows was always a pain. Yeah, it was different, let's say. Uh, <laughs> in Golang, they decided that concurrency is so important, such a big deal, that it is part of the language itself, right? Uh, not many languages do that. Most of the languages treat concurrency in the similar fashion as C to delegate it to the operating system. Uh, but some languages have it built in and Golang is, is one of those languages. So concurrency is built in into the language itself, um, which is quite nice because you don't need to learn uh, additional thing. It, it kind of is part of the language. Um, and it is pretty, pretty simple. Um, so let's see how you guys doing very consistently. Uh, only three questions, so not much of a difference. Well, C++ didn't win this time. Uh, Hula Hop won. Congratulations. So yeah, we can skip that. Uh, I already discussed it, right? Why do we, why concurrency is such a big deal? Because all the hardware we, we deal with is you know, parallel. Uh, increased performance, very good. Um, it is hard. So, um, yeah. What else? Why else? So, performance is one big one. What else do we want concurrency for? What, what do you think? Yeah, no jokes, just kind of a serious answer. <laughs> so uh, there is a, a ability, for example, of your mobile phone to turn off uh, most of the uh, cores and leave just one. Why? Why do they do that? Why your mobile phone turns off the hardware cores? Yeah, what is the key constraint of the mobile phone? Any ideas? That was, that used to be a very big deal for mobile devices and mobile phones, but now in servers, it became a big deal as well. And for example, Amazon and other kind of a cloud service providers, they offer ARM uh, uh, blades. And the main reason why they offer ARM blades instead of Intel blades is what? 
Yep. Exactly, to save power. So it's much cheaper for them to run arm blades than the inter blades and they charge customers less. So then you as a customer who pick who picks a kind of a blade or a CPU architecture, which is energy efficient, is kind of cheaper cost-wise for you as well. So the big deal on mobile phone is the battery life, right? And energy consumption. So by turning off hardware cores, we can save battery, right? So if your program is organized into kind of a sleep mode where you don't need a lot of uh, processing and into kind of a work mode where you do need uh, processing, you can kind of uh, offload things to one thread in the, in the sleep mode. But then if you kind of your game wakes up or your system wakes up and needs to do more heavy lifting, then you kind of uh, fire up additional threads and you benefit from the, from the hardware. All right, so uh, of course the outside world is concurrent. So we like when we're building software, we often need to deal with the the fact that you know um, we not the world is not a Turing machine which sequentially gives us input. It's kind of very concurrent, right? Um, so that's important one. The second one is user interactions. So we often use concurrency not because we want the things to be as fast as possible but because we want to kind of stay in touch with the user while we're doing things in the background right so the ui when the user clicks on a button should be responsive but the click on the button may for example launch kind of a download of a file or, or something on the back end and you want that to happen at the same time while you're communicating to the user a progress bar right so you want things not necessarily to be like the fastest possible, but to be concurrent just for the sake of being concurrent, being kind of in touch with the user. Uh, so like doing network requests, file access, database access, all those things require a little bit of time. And it's good not to be doing all of it in the main thread. It's good to be doing it in the, you know, work thread and the UI being responsive to the user, right? Um, in... It's so important that uh, both Android and iOS now enforce things related to I.O. to be done in separate threads. So when you're programming mobile applications, for example, you cannot read file or access a database or re request something from the network from the main thread of your application because it's forbidden. It's actually like a, a bug and the system will complain. The system will prevent you doing that. It will force you to do things like I.O. in separate threads. Uh, and leave the main thread for the UI, for the interaction with the user. Um, all right, and that is also very useful abstraction for modeling agency. Like if you have uh, multi-agent systems or if you have some sort of actors or some demons that you need to model in your software, then making them run in separate threads, that's the, uh, the good thing. And of course, performance, right? But most of the time we don't care. Most of the systems you will be developing are not real-time systems. And most of the time, the actual performance in terms of CPU is not the main factor. But it might be in terms of the energy usage, right? You might be tasked with building a server system, which is the least energy consuming the possible, right? Uh, so in that case, you, you will want to be optimizing for that. All right. So... Um, what do we use for concurrency in programming? What constructs do you know so far? And what have you used? Uh, threads or p threads. Yeah, that, that, that is the, the library that you use in C, uh, p threads. Uh, so use libraries and p threads is a library. What the library offers? The library offers semaphores. What else the, the library offers? The library offers a construct of creating a thread. Um, what else? <clears throat> Locks. Yeah, that's a good one. And mutexes. Yes, exactly, for synchronization. So we do kind of need semaphores and mutexes for synchronization. We need some construct for concurrency for like the actual uh, threading. Um, and then we have... Um, uh, some construct for preventing uh, race conditions like atomics, right? So nobody mentioned that, but that's another um, kind of a co construct that you need. Coming back to threads, um, if, you, if you think about it, um, from the most abstract level, 
you have kind of a two programs, uh, two, two kind of constructs that run concurrently, and they be either managed by the language itself, or this management of concurrency can be delegated to the operating system, right? So if it is delegated to the operating system, we talk about threats. If it's managed by the runtime system itself, we often talk about green threats or light threats. They are not as heavy as the operating system ones, but they allow you to do concurrency. And many languages have that, including Golang. Uh, Java also had that. Um, and the mapping between the actual thread, if you say, I want a new thread, and the operating system thread may not be one-to-one. -one. It might be like the runtime system might create, let's say, 10 uh, um, uh, operating system threads. But from your language, you might have created 100. And then for each of the operating system threads, you will have 10 seemingly independent threads in your language, right? And Golang is like that. So when you say in Golang, we will see in a minute that I want new threads, it doesn't mean they will, they, you will have operating system threads directly. You may not. It may be the runtime system kind of a multiplexing and uh, executing concurrently what seemingly is kind of a concurrent. Um, and this further down is mapped to the actual hardware, right? So if I have, um, you know, uh, eight core CPU, like I have a laptop with eight cores, which can run eight things really parallel. Um, operating system creates this abstraction saying, we have, you know, hundreds of processes that run concurrently, but they really run on those eight threads. And then your language runtime system can create thousands of threads, which are mapped to those operating system threads, which are mapped to the hardware, right? So sometimes when you're programming, you want to say, I want re to restrict what the runtime system is doing to be limited to eight because I only have eight threads and I want my green threads to be real kind of threads on the, on the runtime system. So you can control that by uh, programming like how you want to map the high level kind of a green threads from the language into the uh, operating system. Operating system threads are quite heavy. So you cannot have thousands of them, right? So the typical system, um, the typical Unix system has a limit, usually around 1000 or 2000 uh, threads and that's it. If you spawn more, you're gonna kill your system because they are quite heavy in terms of memory usage and some additional infrastructure that is needed to manage those threads. So you cannot have thousands of threads uh, on the operating system level. And also it doesn't make so much sense because as I said, you may have eight or 32 or whatever uh, hardware threads you have, but you don't have thousands of them. Um, so this kind of mapping from this high level abstraction of concurrency down to the hardware needs to be controlled somehow. And uh, the runtime systems such as in Go allow you to not think too much about it. Like in Go, you can create 10,000, 100,000 threads and it is really cheap because the runtime system manages that complexity for you and it manages the mapping to the hardware and operating system threads for you. So you kind of don't care. And you can pretty much create, you know, 1,000, 2,000 threads and don't worry about it. Then it will run pretty efficiently. Um, how Golang is doing it? Well, it, it's doing it by keeping track of your functions and keeping track of what how long time each function was taking and kind of are multiplexing it for you, right? Um, but some of this work will be mapped to, to the operating system threads and then to the hardware. So it is um, kind of a robust and a relatively straightforward model. So the concepts that you need to know is Go routines. A Go routine is an equivalent of a thread. So as you were saying, like in C, new thread, here you just say Go and then name of the function, and suddenly that function becomes kind of run in a separate thread, right? So that it's super easy and super trivial. Um, so go routines is one uh, uh, term that you need to know, and then channels. Channels is a little bit new. Um, so we will spend a little bit of time discussing the, the concept of channels, but conceptually, you should think about it as if, if it is a kind of a pipe, and then you can stuff 
some vari variables, some things on one end and consume them on the other end. And some channels are kind of um, of size one, such that they can only hold one thing and you can kind of read one thing at a time. So if you wrote one thing to a channel, the next write will block because it, the channel is busy until someone reads and then the block the uh, uh, write will unblock. If you have a kind of a more space, let's say you make a channel of 10 slots, then 10 writes will be kind of done. None of them will block. The things will be staying in the channel and then you can kind of read 10 times without blocking. But if the channel is empty, the read will block or if the channel is full, the write will block, right? So that's how channels work. We will see uh, in a moment in the code. So go routines and channels. Why do we use channels? Well, channel is because you can pass channels around. Channel is a very good abstraction for passing messages between threads and for synchronization. So without using semaphores and mutexes and all that kind of a low level constructs, you can basically write all the concurrent, well, let's say not all, but most of the concurrent things that you will need using go routines and channels. You don't need anything else. Um, if you want, you can go to mutexes and, um, and semaphores if, or atomics for special purpose kind of tasks. But in general, if you can solve your kind of a concurrency communication, channels are the way to go uh, together with the go routines. And then you do have mutexes and atomic primitives available as well through the um, build-in standard library, which offers you those, those primitive uh, things. And then there is uh, an extra um, construct, which is because when you um, spawn those functions, those concurrent functions, often you, you need to wait until they are finished. And then you can have uh, a construct which is called wait group. Uh, and the wait group allows you to wait for things to finish such that you can continue execution. It, it is kind of a form of a, of a semaphore, right? In fact, it is implemented like on the low level as a semaphore, uh, but it, it is kind of called wait group. And then you are uh, declaring it and using it instead of directly using a semaphore. But it, it kind of fulfills the same, the same function. All right, so let me just quickly um, check what questions do we have with the... Um, Yep, so I will go and check what questions we have in the Mentimeter. Any questions from the room? If not, just let me open. All right, so in terms of questions. Okay, uh, that's for um, for Christopher. Do we know the date of the exam? No, check your um, program, uh, the, like the cost director website, the exam is there, generally. Okay. Because we don't decide this really. Can I use a microphone? As in, as in possibility or? Uh, yeah, is it like, who, who doesn't hear me? Kind of really. All right. I, I can use a microphone, but uh, do I need to use a microphone? So the answer is yes. Should I use a microphone? So uh, people in Zoom can hear me fine and I think here it's okay. All right, so answered, uh, that's answered. Um, do we have tasks and exercises about this topic, uh, Christopher? Yeah, you have exercise afterwards. Ultimately, concurrency is um, more concept you need to understand when we talk about in, uh, invoking and interacting with web services. But a lot of that is actually handled by, for instance, the HTTP package, something you're gonna learn about next week onwards uh, in the background anyway, in the first place. For your assignment it may matter and also your yeah, bad luck you're doing a project so there may be some concurrency there if you're keen to implement this or use it as part of your work 
Um, so we'll definitely draw on the concepts um, uh, in as far as they're related, but they are not, we're, you know, you're not, um, they're not the key objective because this is not a programming course. It sounds like it, no? Bad luck. It's actually a cloud technologies course, right? So we're using programming as one of the components to understand and use cloud technologies, right? So it's not that we are exploiting all the features of a language, but we use it to solve a particular problem, yep. right? So it's a very different approach. If you go to Prop 2006, the answer may yeah. be different. So, so we will have, like in Prop 2006, we will have some uh, lab about this. Um, although, uh, yeah, exactly. For this course, for the cloud, uh, you will have to do concurrency because the servers are always um, concurrent. You cannot like open a server and be blocking when the new request comes because you can have multiple requests coming and your handlers have to handle the request kind of concurrently, right? But most of it will be kind of done for you. So the framework and the server uh, libraries that you're going to use for the course will be handling the concurrency for you. So you'll be just writing handlers registering the handlers and then the concurrency will just happen. Um, so most of the time you kind of don't need to deal with it. Uh, but if you if you have a request and you need to do two things or fetch something from the web, you may want to start a new thread as a job to, to do that, right? So you may need to use it as Christopher said in your project or in some of the assignments, but you may not need to directly use it yourself. Uh, you just need to understand what, what is going on. Uh, but in uh, the other course, we will look a little bit more into parallelism and concurrency, uh, and it will be a, a little bit later once we start with Rust, uh, because in Haskell, we kind of don't care too much, but it, it is happening behind the scene uh, by the language itself. Uh, okay. Um, so there, are, there is a suggestion of having kind of a homeworks as we do have in the programming course. We can we can do that. Um, I can post some some labs or about Golang for this. Um, yeah, that's a philosophical question. I, I guess Christopher can deal with that later. <laughs> the exam is not. It's mixed. Huh? It's a mix. I mean, uh, the, the course is not a programming course. Doesn't mean it doesn't include programming. I mean, any of the courses that you have uh, will in involve some programming, I guess. But uh, there will be a bit of everything that we do in the course. So by design, there's some programming and there's also a bit of programming, but it's not the majority of the course. But on the other hand, the exam is never made to be hard. It's something, if you do the assignments properly and actually you submit them and you know you have a reasonable performance there, then I think the exam will not challenge you at all as far as programming is concerned. Because it's mostly to assess whether you're actually individually able to do what you did already anyway. But in an assignment setting, I don't know how, or well, we don't know how you did it, right? In exam, we can, we can control how you do it, right? So just to assess your individual performance, that's fundamentally the purpose. Not so much to put you uh, uh, before unsurmountable challenges or something. So that's not the concern you should be having. Yeah. All right, so let, let me do this. So I will go to uh, PROC uh, 2023. Uh, we have this structure for, um, yeah, so zero one, right? Yeah, please. Uh, zero one, uh, go on currency. Yeah, okay. The previous one was zero zero. I see. Uh, all right, zero one. So let's uh, let's try to code something. So let's see uh, what we can do in terms of those those things, right? So let's uh, try a kind of a trivial, um, yeah. So I will have kind of a code. Um, I will say uh, touch uh, main dot go. Um, I will have a file here. Uh, ay -ay -ay. Package main, uh, func main, and we'll do something with it. Um, and then we say go mod in it. And we say um, hello concurrency, hello C. 
hello C. Um, all right, so then uh, what I will do is I will go to the go tour and we will see what I can explain a little bit more. Yeah, so that's fine. Okay, so then we have, um, there is a section about concurrency. Uh, there is a section about generics. There was a, a question about generics last uh, last time and I explained the, the basic but, uh, basics, but you can kind of uh, check it out. Um, they have, so instead of me typing code, we'll just kind of quickly analyze what, what do, do they do, right? So as I said, to run a thread, to run a Go routine, you just have to prefix the invocation of the function with go. Um, so you can see here we have, uh, um, you know, say, we have a, a simple function say, which uh, prints something five times, right? So if I run, if I run this function uh, world, what's gonna happen is it, it sleeps 100 milliseconds and then prints whatever parameter I passed. And then we, we so what's gonna happen is we're gonna print world five times and then we're gonna print hello five times, right? And each printout will be delayed by this uh, 100 millisecond uh, uh, delay, right? So as you see here, that's what exactly what happens. It kind of a prints world and prints um, he uh, hello afterwards. If I reduce the delay to one milliseconds, it's gonna be instantaneous, right? You don't see this delay, right? If you delay it by one second, one second, then it's kind of slow. It will be printing world once per second, right? Gonna kill it. So now if we run those two functions in parallel, like concurrently, right? Uh, not in parallel, we don't know if it will run in parallel, but concurrently, uh, what's gonna happen? Let's go back to 100 milliseconds. There will be less waiting. Yes, so there will be less waiting because in original, like let's say we, we're doing one second. So five seconds plus five seconds, that's 10 seconds. So the execution of the program would take, take 10 seconds, right? If we do it concurrently, we're gonna do everything in around five seconds, right? Because the first five seconds and the second one are kind of done at the same time, right? So now the program is gonna take shorter time. That's that's good one. What else? What else will happen? They will. It will be a world hello. Like um, we'll have world hello instead of five world word and five. Exactly. They will be mixed up, right? Because sometimes one thread will run, sometimes the other one will run. So the hello and world words will be printed in kind of a random order, right? So let's try it out. <clears throat> and nothing happened. Hmm, why nothing happened? Maybe something blocked in there? No, the program finished. The, the program finished and nothing has happened. All right. Interesting, right? So, if you did that in um, in C, uh, what would happen is your program would probably crash uh, because you finish the main and you still have running threads, and then the main doesn't have anything to do, and then you know the program will crash because it would say, "I'm kind of about to exit, but you have running threads." So it's a kind of an error, right? Here is the same. What we did is we spawn say twice and then we went here because the second call is non-blocking, right? So we don't have any blocking, which means we executed those two calls and we went to here, which is the end of our main. And the main says, okay, we are done, I'm, I'm quitting, right? And it basically quit. Even though you have two threads still running because they haven't finished their job. So in Golang, it's not a, an error like in C. It basically is a sort of like a condition, which means if you reach the end of your program and you still have some threads running, just kill them, right? So the runtime system just killed all of those threads and quit, right? And they didn't have enough time 
to print the first uh, hello award. So that's why you sometimes have a little bit unexpected behavior because your main will quit, right? So you cannot allow that, right? So if you have situation like this, you have to basically block at the end, right? How can we block at the end? Uh, the cheapest one is just to uh, read something from the user. So keep the main open until the user presses enter, right? So it says like press or press enter to quit or something, right? So then if the user presses enter, the, the main will quit. But if the user waits, then you will have those printouts, right? That's one cheap way of doing it. It's a hack, right? Uh, you can only do that for debugging. You cannot really do that in production. So in production, you kind of need to somehow synchronize at the end. You have to wait for all the printouts to be done, right? Um, and you can do that in here. I, I kind of deleted. I didn't see the original. Like maybe if we refresh it, let's say what was the original. No, the original is buggy, right? So the original is basically what we have now. Or maybe it, it cached what I what I have. What should be here is that the second one is not a go routine, right? And what does it mean is that we have a, a single thread which runs the say world and the main thread runs say hello. And the main thread will not quit until the say hello is done, right? So the main thread now will be running say hello for five seconds or 500 milliseconds while the other one is running in the background, right? So let's try that. And as expected, we have um, hello and world kind of intermingled. And if we count them, so we have uh, one, two, three, four, five. And that's consistent with our logic. Like we should never have less than five hellos, right? Because the hellos are running in the main thread. But is it possible to have less worlds? Yes, it is possible. Like if this thread did five times and finished, we will quit main and we will kill the other one, even though the other one hasn't finished five yet, right? So it is possible that the, the word is less than five. Here we have one, two, three, four, right? We have four. It actually happened uh, for this run that the world didn't print it five times because the main killed it before it could finish, right? So you already see here, it's a trivial problem, but you already see here one typical bug that you have with uh, concurrent programming, which is race condition. You have one thread being faster than the other, and that results in kind of unexpected behavior, right? Because we were kind of expecting to see five worlds and five hellos, but we don't because we have a race. Like the, the second thread is faster. This one was faster than the first one, right? So how can we fix that? Well, we have to fix it by synchronizing by waiting for both threads to do what they're supposed to do and tell us I have done it, right? Um, so let's see if it's, I, I didn't actually run the go tour. Uh, so I don't know if they fixed it by themselves. No, that it seems not. Crap, we have to fix it. <laughs> All right, so we, we have to fix it ourselves. Um, so, the easiest way to fix it would be to um, uh, solve it by the weight group, because we basically have number of threads, in, in this case two, and at the end we have to wait for all of them to, to be done, right? Uh, and for all of them to be done, we basically have to say um, we kind of um, uh, finished, right? So let's let's have a look at the go lang await group documentations go by examples no uh, go packages wait group yes uh, so you want um, we can use mutexes uh, we can use um, mutex ourselves but in this particular case wait group is the easiest thing to, to use, right? So wait group lives in a sync package. Uh, I will make it bigger. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They have a very complicated. Um, 
example yeah so anyway you can read you can read the documentation and you can read the example but i was expecting a little bit simpler example uh, so we will do our simpler example here so in here we will say we have a weight group uh, which is a weight group so let's see um yeah they declaring a, a variable and then they specifying how many uh threads you're gonna have right so we will say we have a, a weight group and we have to say it's in package sync and we have to import sync here and then we're gonna say we're gonna have weight group at and we're gonna have two um two threads in it right we're gonna go with this um uh, in parallel and then we're gonna say wait and this one will block until the weight group is kind of done and how the weight group will be done we have to pass the weight group um to our function a weight group and then we gonna say weight group done we just double check if that is the call yes it is and they also use the defer um defer is quite a nice construct in golang um uh, which means some you you want to postpone something to be done on the closing bracket of the scope that you're currently in right so if you uh, if you look into our example we want to done this as a last thing of our method of our function right uh, which means we want to do this just before the closing bracket so the idiomatic way of doing it in go is not what i did like doing it as the last, last thing of this method but to actually saying uh defer uh wg done right so that is the same code, but it kind of makes um, programming mistakes a little bit uh, harder because that enforces that this is going to be done as the last thing of this. So, so you know, when, like, if you have code like this, uh, so let's say I didn't do it. Let's say I have the code like this. Um, what's the problem with it? With it? Why, why it may not work? Well, you have to think what happens before that, right? In here, I have my body of my method, and I may have an exception. I may have a return statement. I may have a lot of things which will happen before I hit the line 17. And the line 17 may not get executed, right? If I have a return statement somewhere in my uh, in my loop, then the loop will quit the pro program and it, uh, like this function, and I will not hit line 17, right? So in this particular example, I don't have any exceptions and I don't have any return statements. So it is pretty much equivalent, but in, in more complex examples here, some logic may kick you out of the function and then whatever you thought it's gonna happen at the end will not happen, right? And th that's a source of a lot of bugs. Like you didn't close a database, you didn't close the file or whatever, right? You didn't close a connection and you have some, some bugs. So to prevent that, a more idiomatic way is to say defer and defer will always execute this at this closing bracket no matter how you reach that right uh no matter whether there was an exception whether there was a return statement whatever it will always execute it so let's let's try that out so we have um let me just double check uh yeah, so this possibly should work. Uh, sync, weight group, sync. All right. This worked. It printed, um, it printed us five word and five hellos but then we have a deadlock, right? Uh, 
What does that mean? It means at this point, uh, I'm waiting to clear the uh, weight group, but all the threads have already finished. We have a bug in our code, right? So it worked, this line blocked, this line is waiting for um, threads to clear the work group, the semaphore, but the runtime system sa says, look, uh, all the functions that you run concurrently already quit and this work group didn't clear it up. So what the hell? Like you have a deadlock, you will be waiting here forever because there is no other threads running to clear that work group, right? Why do we have this bug? It's a bit of a subtle bug. <laughs> Anyone? We discussed it extensively uh, last time. Yeah? Passing by reference. Exactly. Passing by value or passing by reference, right? Uh, I pass the work group by value, which means it's a copy of the other work group. So these guys are updating a work group. Uh, which is not the one which I'm tracking here, right? So it's it doesn't work because I have to pass it by reference. And if I pass it by reference, um, it says, you are trying to pass this, which is a value into a function which requires a reference. And then we have our program working and we don't have a bug and it works as expected. Yay. Pretty good, right? We solved it. We have two concurrent threads uh, running concurrently. Uh, we just achieve it by running Go uh, and we do the synchronization with this kind of a work group um, mechanism, which is sort of like a semaphore. Originally it's two, and once each of the threads finishes, it says I'm done. And then the semaphore kind of goes down. And then once it reaches zero, this line is reached, the weight stops and we quit cleanly, right? So do you follow the, the logic of this uh, example? Very trivial, very simple, very nice. Uh, if you were to do it with a C, you would have to a little bit deal with a little bit more kind of boilerplate with threads. Uh, and you would have to deal a little bit more boilerplate with the synchronization mechanism, right? A work group is kind of really nice and easy and the synchronization works and it's kind of nice and tidy. So uh, what I will do is I will copy that code um, into the Git repo such that you have a reference later on. Um, right, so I will copy that here. Perfect. So now let's have a look into channels. Um, they do have a section about channels. So uh, they say a channel is kind of like a like um, a type which you declare with the chan um, keyword, right? So in Golang, as every, with everything else, you have a variable. Then you have you specify what type this, this variable is. So you have to say it's a channel by and, and doing you're doing it by, by saying chan and then what type the channel can hold, right? So channels in Golang are typed, same as uh, slices or lists, and it will have a particular uh, type associated with it. But this type can be anything. Uh, so it can be a string, can be a struct, can be a map, can be a list, can be whatever you need to pass around, right? Because a channel is just a mechanism for your threads to communicate and pass data between one thread to another thread, right? Um, so if you have um, uh, a communication between two threads and you need to pass messages or pass something from one uh, thread to another, you will use a channel and then you will specify what, um, what type that channel will have. So that's one thing. The second thing is channels are um, either bidirectional, so you can put stuff in them and read stuff from them, or 
uh, from the perspective of your API, you may constrain a channel and say uh, a particular channel for that function only is to write. The function cannot read from the channel, right? So then you can have one directional channel and you're constraining it by specifying this arrow. Um, so if you, if you say, um, I have a channel which has, um, which has an arrow like on, on the right, right hand side, it means you can only write to it. And if you have uh, an arrow like this, you can only read from it. If you don't specify the arrow, it's a bidirectional channel. So C, like this program can both read and write from the channel, right? But sometimes it's undesirable. Sometimes you don't want a function to be writing to a channel, only reading from a channel, right? Um, so in this particular case, uh, this channel here is bidirectional, but the function is only using it to write into it. And to write into it, you, you use this. Um, you use this, so you're sending value to a channel CH. And if you want to receive something from the channel, you use this. So again, it's with the arrow, like either on the left or right side. If it's something flowing into the channel, it's writing, it's sending into the channel. If it's something flowing out, out of the variable, it's like um, receiving. And you create channels by, by make. So in this particular example, uh, what we have is we have um, a sum function which takes a slice of ints and calculates the, the sum of that slice. And it has a channel. And once the sum is calculated, the sum is being pushed into the channel, right? So we have um, kind of like a worker, worker function which does the summation. And then we have um, a long array of six items. Uh, we create a channel and then we split our array into two halves. So we kind of pass this to the first function and pass this to the second and they both will push uh, the sum, respective sum to the channel. And then here we're using kind of a Golang um, uh, assignment operator, which is using like a destructuring. So we can have uh, multiple variables on one side and multiple expressions on the other. And it kind of, uh, um, you know, um, assigns the first sum to X and the second sum to Y. And then it prints, you know, the, uh, the, the total at the end. So we kind of, you know, we solved uh, like, let, th this is like a trying to sum a, a, a large array. And then we say we can speed it up by summing half of it and then half of it concurrently uh, in two different threads and then adding them uh, to get the final result, right? Um, so it's kind of like, a, you know, um, we're splitting the problem into two concurrent problems and then we're combining the results to get the final answer. And a lot of problems are like that. A lot of problems are trivially uh, parallelizable. And then you can kind of use pattern like this. Um, so let's run it. And the first sum is minus five. The second sum is 17. And then if you sum them together, it's 12. So if you add all those numbers, you should get 12 at the end, right? Um, if we remove the minus, we will have 13, 17, and 30, right? So here we have um, 13. That's, that, that's this part, right? So we like, even though we we starting the first one, yeah, we will have a break after this. So um, we starting two two halves. The first one is started first, but we got the first answer, which is the second one, right? Again, we see the erase condition here. When you're starting two things concurrently, it doesn't mean the first thing you started will start will will finish first. 
it may finish second. And that's what happened here. So 17 is this one, is this sum, and 13 is this sum, right? And we got the first one here. So that's the that one, the first read out of the channel. Okay, any questions about this? If there are no questions, let's have a break indeed. So let's meet um, half past. So we will have a nine minutes break. How does that sound? No, 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 nine. <laughs> All right. Right, so there will be a, a little bit less in the video than we discussed here. All right, so then we have um, uh, then we have this kind of usual uh, two, you know, two version for the assignment or two version for the read. Um, and it may happen that uh, the channel is closed. So as, as a, like when we make a channel, we say make and make as a channel, but at some point, one of the threads may decide, okay, we've used up the, the channel and now we're closing it. Like th there will be no more communication through that channel. So then if you do this, if you close the channel, then nobody can read and nobody can write to it anymore. And if you try, you will have a panic, you will have a runtime exception. So to prevent that, if you're using um, closing channels, then you have to use construct like that to check if the channel just by um, your logic of, of the program was not closed. Because if it was closed, then the, um, you know, uh, okay will be false, right? Uh, and then you know you you're not supposed to read or write from that channel anymore. Um, in our previous programs, we didn't use this because we never closed the channels. We didn't have the call to close the channels, right? So we don't need to be checking if the channel was closed or not. All right, so then we have this non-blocking thing. So um, sometimes when you have a channel, you only want to check if there is a value there. Uh, and if there is no value, of, of course the channel needs to be open. Like if, if the channel is closed, it's closed, no, nothing can happen, but the channel is open and the channel can be either empty or it can have a value, it can have a value. So if, if it has a value, uh, we want to read it, but if it doesn't have a value, we don't want to block, right? So, so you often have a case, so let's go back to, uh, to our example here. Um, we, uh, let's say, uh, we have a channel of three. We wrote two things. And then the, the third thing is a little bit non-deterministic. Like you may have a third user or you may not have, right? And depending whether you do or not, you want either to print it or you want to quit, right? So in, in here, what we want is we want to be non-blocking, right? So non-blocking. Here we are blocking. We are, so this code is blocking code. Uh, and then if we were to, to say, I want to read a third value only if there is a third value, if there is no third value, I, I'm, I'm just quitting the program, right? I don't want to be blocking here. Why? Because if I block here and there is no third value, then I'm going to have a deadlock, right? If the third value is not going to happen. So if it happened, it is there, but if it didn't happen, I don't want to have a deadlock, right? So then we do something like, um, like uh, this example where we use a select. Um, and select is kind of like a switch statement, which has kind of a rows. And each row is an attempt to either read or write to a channel. And that can either, uh, no, you only can read from channels. Um, and then you can, um, um, do something and then you have a default case which you're doing if none of the other cases worked or you can quit the select if none of the other cases worked right so uh let's go back and and do that so we basically say select and then it's it, it is kind of like a switch statement so we say case and now in the case we can uh, read from a channel right asynchronously 
So let's uh, read a value A uh, from a channel C. And then if that is, is there, a, uh, you have to look up the syntax. The syntax is uh, like in C with the with the colon, and then you have the multi-line body afterwards. So you would have a colon, and then you would do something. So in our case, we just print uh, print line A, and then you can have a default. And here, um, do something when no other case matched um, and here here we will get without blocking right so if there is a third number we will print it if there is no third number we will get here and quit the program and there will be no deadlock right because if i try to read if i try to have this line Without the select, it will be a blocking, right? So let's let's do that. Blocking version. So let's uh, let's run this, and you know we will have um, ch. Okay. A is not used. Yes, A is not used. Uh, so we have to have it here. You see, so we printed one and two, and then we get here and we have a deadlock because this reading of A is blocking and we don't have the third value. So we have a deadlock. So to prevent that, we can have the same logic because we might have a third thread which might have produced the third value uh, by doing this kind of a non-blocking version instead. So if we run this one, we print one and two and we have no error. We have no problems. So to prove it that we got here, uh, print line program and it cleanly. Right, so you run it and it says, yeah, we got here and this line is reading, is trying to read a value from a channel, but because the channel is empty, it says, yep, there, there was no value. So we got to this one, right? So we can also print something here. We can say uh, format, uh, no channels had anything. So what will happen is this select will go to this case. We'll check if there is something in CH. If the channel is empty, it will go to the default case. It will print this and then it will go here and we will click quit cleanly the program. And that's what happened. Does that make sense? Perfect. So I will copy that as well. Um, so I will copy, uh, let's copy, the, let's copy the whole function. I will then change the name. I will commit those uh, examples into the Git repo such that you have a reference point. So, okay, so example, uh, blocking, non-blocking. All right, so then um, that's pretty much all that you really need to know about um, uh, about go routines and channels. So the the final thing left for the uh, for synchronization is the use of mutexes, and it is basically the same as in any programming language where you kind of have a mutex. Uh, and where you kind of need to lock and unlock. Uh, so you basically kind of create 
a mutex and then for the critical section you enclose it into the lock and unlock of course where should the unlock be that is often a source of bugs as well if you have in your critical section an exception or if you have a return statement and you never unlock the the mutex you're gonna have a deadlock because your kind of critical section didn't unlock the mutex right so you should kind of move uh this to be more idiomatic uh you should say defer unlock right no matter what happens even if i kind of have an exception i should still unlock the mutex because i'm not doing anything with the critical uh, value anymore right uh, so then you have kind of a you 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 know you locking the mutex you're doing the critical section right um yeah a question about uh, idiomatic use so here you unlocking before you locking hypothetically right assuming the lock doesn't succeed and the method quits or whatever else you're still performing the unlock would you would you always link um or the question is more like if in, if a defer manages closing of resort would we better keep like the defer close to the resource specification declaration or just literally put it in the beginning no because you think about http requests you may have different sockets that you open that's right, right? so um yeah you 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 100 correct so it if it happens that lock hasn't happened then this will be an error because you're trying to unlock something that hasn't been locked so that will be a panic as well so you should keep it together so you should keep the defer in a place when it kind of is logical that the lock has happened right so it, it, it's correct that uh this like if there is other code here then defer is not in the first line the defer comes with the lock so you're sort of saying i'm gonna lock and I'm going to defer the unlock so that unlock always happens because I know lock happens, right? So those two lines come together, right? But. And then the other way around, right? right. 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 Sorry? The other way around, right? If we're following the lock request, uh, lock instruction. Possibly. Yeah, you, you can do that. Yes, exactly. You can, you can even do that as Christopher suggests. You can do that, which is even more logical, right? You know, lock has happened. And then you're deferring the unlocking to be unconditional of the critical section, right? And then the uh, critical section follows, right? So that that is a very idiomatic way of of doing it. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Christopher. Um, should you use mutexes? Uh, yeah, depends. In this particular case, what they are doing is they have uh, a map and they are updating the map. Um, so if you can uh, do something with atomics, instead of using a mutex, you should use atomics. If using atomics is not as trivial or as easy, then you go for the mutex. So updating a map, yeah, mutex is fine. Incrementing a counter, no, use uh, atomics, right? Uh, you have primitive calls in atomics package for incrementing, decrementing um, numbers and things like that. Use the atomics instead. Uh, but yeah, if you're familiar with the mutex, you can do that. Um, um, all right, so let me check the questions. Ay, 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 ay. Break, break, break. Okay, there is a question. Um, um, all right, so I will show you show you the questions. Um, this one for a future lab lecture, could we go through how to organize files and go in different folders when you have a multi-file module project? Um, yeah, we can. Uh, Refer back to the video on the one end. So yeah. We can watch it slower, but we can talk about it as well. Yeah. So the, as as we did cover it in the last lecture, you can watch the video and kind of uh, rewatch that part about organ organizing the folders. Uh, but it will come up with the with the more complicated examples. And Christopher will have uh, codes examples yeah. in the repo which kind of show you how how to organize it I mean, it, it depends a bit on your on your code base in the first place but also what do you use go for right so right now we didn't really talk about web services or cloud stuff and so on 
and then it becomes very logical to have a you know standardized organization. Um, that's what we're really going to talk about. That's uh, will will be use, will be second nature. That's definitely not one of the challenges that we have at the end of the course. <laughs> uh, I think uh, organizing your that part. But it's a good, very good point because it's it looks a bit similar to how it's done in Java, but it's not. So um, that's something we need to discuss a bit. So that's right. It, from one hand, it is similar, but from the other hand, it is kind of confusing sometimes. Yeah, it's, it's um, more consistent. Yes. So the problem with Golang is they have some idea very early on for uh, Golang 1.0, which turned out to be broken. And that those ideas still linger in some, yeah. some of the language uh, packages and some of the Git packages and so on. And now with the new kind of modular uh, um, uh, semantics and modules, it, it's a little bit inconsistent. but like the new model it works and it, it is quite intuitive it's just reading some older docs get you know can get you a little bit confused oh, older projects. So exactly yeah fun. all right so we're running out of time i had uh what i had uh after that is testing so i sort of um uh run out of, of the I slot um, testing um at some stage later and uh, when it makes sense so when yeah yeah, no, no, that's good. Thank you. So if you have any kind of language related questions, use the Discord or use the wiki, no, uh, the tracker. issue tracker. Yeah. I mean, the issue um, tracker has the benefit that everyone sees it, right? So it's a bit persistent. Like in the Discord, you know, it moves up there. No one remembers anymore what someone asked in January, you know, 22nd, right? But uh, if it stays in the, in the wiki, in the issue tracker, it's kind of something that we can use as a resource, like an alternative to hint stack overflow. Um, so, you know, that's both internal. So it's quite, get used to using this thing. It's actually quite um, yeah. productive if we do this. Yeah, next week we're talking a bit more about um, switching between REST, first of all, talking a bit more standard, web standards in a way. And then we'll see again how we use them in Go. So we bring it back together. But that's where we, you know, um, jump between concepts and then the application in code. So that's why I'm saying it's a technology, it's not a programming course. But um, that's what's happening next week. Mark, uh, Marius is going to provide the example as part of the repo. We talk about the repo structure as well, because there's more to come. Yep. Um, and if there's any other question, yeah, just keep it for next week and then we go from there. Have a good weekend already, or do you guys still have lectures? Yeah. Yes, you do? Okay. Good. Good. Um, yes. No, that sounds good. Uh, testing is perfectly fine because I covered this nowadays anyway later. I saw it. I saw it. Uh, I'm stopping now. Yeah. So I, I, so I 